Tonight on NJTV News, misbehaving in the not-so-friendly skies. Can lawmakers legislate how airlines treat their customers? Can U.S. senators block President Trump's executive order that could lead to oil rigs offshore in the Atlantic? Advocates for unauthorized immigrants protest the president's immigration orders, and a dreamer under threat of deportation speaks out. Political power hitters headline a summit on ways to view and treat substance use disorder. And Rutgers has done it again, pushed the horticultural envelope to create the hottest of hot pumpkin peppers. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. A crackdown on airlines for bad behavior. Top lawmakers have written legislation that would hold airlines accountable for the way they treat passengers. David Cruz reports. In case your travel nightmares have kept you underground, your fellow travelers, those in the skies, have been experiencing customer service turbulence. In case you missed it, there's the guy who got dragged off a plane. Oh my God, look at what you did to him. The lady who got into it with a flight attendant over a stroller, and of course there's poor Simon, who paid the ultimate price. Today, New Jersey senators said enough is apparently enough. It's time we start reversing the years of customer neglect that have many people dreading traveling at all. Menendez and Senator Booker say they're putting up a bill to make sure passengers get a fair shake from what they characterize as a greedy airline industry, the Tickets Act, may be better known as the Transparency Improvement and Compensation to Keep Every Ticket Holder Safe Act, has five key points. It guarantees boarded passengers the right to fly, that is, no more forced deplanings. It provides fair compensation for ticket holders. Some airlines have already altered their policies on this. United will go up to $10,000. It improves transparency, mainly on airline bumping policies. It addresses ticket overselling, giving the transportation secretary power to set an overbooking policy for the industry. And it requires flight crews to check in an hour before flight, as opposed to, say, when the flight is already full of paying passengers. Need to check a bag? That's a fee. Need to travel with your pet? That's a fee. Want a seat next to your spouse? There's a fee. Meanwhile, economy passengers are squeezed together like sardines just to sell a few more tickets per flight. And in Washington, the airline industry is spending millions to lobby for the repeal of the full fare advertising rule so that they can mask the true cost of flight from customers. Today's press conference at Terminal B drew some curious onlookers, some of whom were here waiting for their luggage. The security is a long time. It's a lot. To take. How about on the flights? Um, I've been on the two flights and it's been pretty good. I was a one stop to my destination, no issues. We didn't have to pay for the carry on. We were told we don't have to pay. Coming back this morning, we had to pay six to five dollars each, which cost us almost two hundred dollars. We weren't told. I just went to the office here, nobody can give me a good answer. Well, our flight was delayed. Before they left at five forty four, we didn't leave to ten. Wow. Exactly. The Democrats criticized the Republican administration and Congress for turning a blind eye to an industry that has been increasingly tight, squeezing passengers in the pocketbook and then into increasingly smaller seats. Booker says lawmakers have to use whatever leverage they have to force the airlines into better behavior. No airline should be able to privatize all their profits and push onto other people onto the backs of Americans the costs of doing their business. Booker says half a million people a year get bumped off flights. He says Congress can threaten to hold up the reauthorization of the FAA as a way to force them to comply with the stricter rules. But the FAA reauthorization vote isn't until September, which means it'll be a while before Congress can use that leverage to make your skies 
a little more friendly. At Newark Airport, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. Congressional lawmakers are trying to block a move by President Trump that could once again allow oil drilling offshore. Michael Hill reports. Members of New Jersey's congressional delegation used their trip to the shore to help Belmar celebrate the reopening of the Taylor Pavilion, rebuilt on the sandy destroyed boardwalk with federal money. They and Belmar's mayor also took advantage of this seaside resort to blast the Trump administration's plan for seismic blasting to pave the way for oil drilling and exploration in the Atlantic Ocean. Please, just leave the oceans alone. Let them be. Last Friday, Donald Trump inked another executive order. And direct Secretary Zinke to allow responsible development of offshore areas that will bring revenue to our Treasury and jobs to our workers. Yeah. Our coastline is not for sale. We must now say no to the drilling. Senators Booker and Menendez and Congressman Frank Pallone announced they would reintroduce the Clean Ocean and Safe Tourism Anti-Drilling Act. It stops the Atlantic from ever ending up in any plan. It draws a line in the sand, a line that we must never let big oil cross. The members of Congress say drilling and a spill would devastate New Jersey's multi-billion dollar tourism and fishing industries. Ask those in the Gulf Coast in Alabama, in Mississippi, in Louisiana, about what happens when oil drilling happens off of their coasts. The senators thought this was a battle that had been fought and won in the Obama administration just last year, getting the Interior Department to remove the Atlantic Ocean from the five-year plan for oil and gas leasing in the Outer Continental Shelf. Now, I'm no mathematician, but I never expected we would be revisiting the five-year plan six months later. Yet here we are. The congressman says Republicans block protections drawn up after the BP Horizon spill. There's no protection. There can't even be any protection. We know that. That's what BP actually proved. Activists armed with placards and protests of the Trump plan stood with the members of Congress arguing the nation should find energy elsewhere. Going on a pathway to fossil fuels is a pathway to the dinosaurs, and we know they went ex extinct. The delegation says it's not fishing for a fight with the new administration, but the oil drilling executive order goes against the current from the previous administration. In Belmar, Michael Hill, NJTV News. Averting an infestation of gypsy moths. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Upper Township, one of 11 towns in line for aerial spraying. Gypsy moth caterpillars can eat through an evergreen in a year, so the state agriculture department starts spraying now using what it calls a biological insecticide that doesn't hurt people, mammals, or bees, only caterpillars, and only if they eat the insecticide at precisely the right moment, after they've emerged from their eggs, but before they turn into moths. A fungus killed off many of the moths last season, so this year's gypsy moth population is low, but the state's spraying and says it'll warn residents of the schedule ahead of time. Not on the spraying list and want to be? You're advised to call a private exterminator. Next to Maplewood, winner of the Quiet Hero Award from Noise Free America, the Citizen Action Group usually releases a noisy dozen list of noise polluters, but this year it's decided to try positive reinforcement. And it likes the town's ordinance that bars commercial landscapers from using gas-powered leaf blowers from May through September. The New Jersey Landscape Contractors Association trade group doesn't like it, claims it unfairly targets them, and says it plans to file an injunction to stop the implementation of the ordinance. Finally, New Brunswick making a lot of noise. The annual Rutgers Day Festival drew more than 100,000 people to its three campuses Saturday, almost 10,000 more than last year when the Scarlet Knights were celebrating their 250th anniversary. On College Ave, it kicked off with a student parade, and a team of engineering students and Formula Racing Club members showed off their race car. On the Cook campus, a crowd in the Rutgers Equestrian Science Center watched a former harness racing horse have her strength tested, and a physics professor tested his fire extinguisher-powered cart, and plant researchers offered a tasting of their new pumpkin habanero pepper.
which is hot. And that's our Garden State Express for Monday, May 1st. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSE&G, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. May 1st has long been recognized as International Workers' Day, marked by marches for workers' rights. Here in New Jersey, marchers were also focused on immigrants' rights, including the rights of those not authorized to be here. Brenda Flanagan reports. No ban! No ban! More than a thousand union laborers, immigrants, and advocates gathered in afternoon sun at Liberty State Park with its symbolic backdrop of the lady with the torch who welcomes those seeking refuge in America. That's this May Day's theme, and it's pointedly anti-Trump. The agenda of this administration has to be divide people, to make immigrants feel like they don't belong here. And what today is all about is to say to immigrants and workers that we're here to stay. Welcoming communities like Jersey City are important into this country, they're built uh, the backbone of this country, and uh, that there is a resistance and pushback to the policies of the president. Mayor Steve Fulop declared Jersey City a sanctuary back in February and said it will resist attempts by the Trump administration to detain and deport unauthorized immigrants. For dreamer Erica Solis, it's a fraught time. Maybe one day ISIS came to my door and said, Erica, you are deported. Well, what happened with my two kids? I don't have nobody who will take care of them. So that, that's my issue. At this May Day rally, the crowd danced. But in this highly charged political climate, consensus remains elusive. So far, the president's efforts to ban immigrants from certain nations and strip federal funding from sanctuary cities have been stymied by court decisions. The latest congressional budget agreement announced today contains no money for his wall on the Mexican border, though on Saturday, he promised a crowd in Pennsylvania it's coming. And we need the wall, and we will build the wall as sure as you are standing there tonight. We need the wall. At another rally at Rutgers, New Brunswick, about 200 students and faculty gathered to support Dreamer Karimer Andujar. The engineering major, president of Undocu Rutgers and an outspoken advocate for immigrants, says her DACA permit expired because of a paperwork mix-up by her lawyer, and she's been summoned for an interview at ICE's deportation offices. Despite the administration's insistence, it's not targeting Dreamers. I'm walking into ICE without any form of deportation protection. How do you feel about that? Um, for lack of a better word, I'm scared. Uh, but I do know I have a lot of support, not only from the students, faculty, and staff here, but also from elected officials. Her fear did not prevent her from speaking out at the rally, calling for amnesty. If DACA recipients are being deported, then DACA is not enough. What needs to happen is that undocumented people who have never committed a crime need to be granted amnesty. But a knot of counter-protesters waved flags and disagreed. That completely contradicts American values and a system of law and order and fairness for both legal immigrants and American citizens, and it presents a major, and I mean major, threat to our lives and safety. On one of the most diverse campuses in the nation, immigrants say they feel their security jeopardized in the wake of recent ICE crackdowns. Egyptian immigrant Abdo El Fiki, who just started a new grease truck restaurant here in January, says he's glad to see the rally. You know, you cannot stop anyone. This is what is good about America, it's a freedom, you know. In New Brunswick, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Tonight, a gathering at the NJ PAC. Candidates vying to replace Governor Christie address some of our biggest social and racial justice challenges, brought together for a conversation co-moderated by our Michael Hill, by the NAACP and the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Michael? Mary Alice, nine candidates will be on stage for approximately two hours. That's six Democrats, two Republicans, and one Green Party candidate. With us now is the CEO of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, Ryan Haygood. Ryan, thank you for joining us. What do you hope to get from these candidates? You know, Michael, I think ultimately what we want from these candidates is a clear sense of what their vision is for positioning New Jersey to serve as a standard bearer for social and racial justice nationally. You know, we're thinking about some of the most pressing 
social justice issues of our time in the areas of reimagining the criminal justice system, in the area of creating an inclusive democracy, bridging the economic divide, uh, protecting human and civil rights, advancing a world-class education for all of our children. These are really some of the issues that we've been grappling with as a state as part of a national conversation. And our question for these candidates is, if you are elected as governor, how will you cast an affirmative vision for positioning New Jersey to lead this country in terms of being a national standard bearer for social and racial justice? Ryan, how do you get, because it's not every day you can draw candidates uh, on a stage like this to talk about social sure. justice issues. Tax policies, governing policies, sure. yes, but social justice, how do you pull this off? Well, Michael, because this is what the voters care about. You know, I think this event, we were, as you know, as a moderator tonight, we were overwhelmed by the response. So NJ PAC had more than 1,000 RSVPs. And we will have a packed house in the auditorium. There are more than 300 seats in the overflow. The voters care about these issues. They've been following them nationally. They've watched them play out in their communities. And I think voters, Michael, more than anything else, are aware that in this moment, in this national moment, change is going to happen from the ground up in our communities, that it is on us to effectuate the change that we want to seek. And the question for these candidates for governor is, how will you advance the change that we want to seek in our communities? in the state of New Jersey and on a national level. And you said more than a thousand RSVPs, sure. so you had to turn some people away. We did. We had, we had to cap the RSVPs at a thousand. We had to make space for several hundred seats in the overflow. And the good news is that NJTV is streaming this live so that those folks who couldn't make it here tonight to be here in the building can watch the conversation unfold online, and we encourage folks to do that. And I understand it will be available on YouTube even after the live stream tonight as well. Absolutely. That's right. And we want, the, we want voters to pay careful attention, to pay a mindful eye to the words that the candidates for governors utter because those words matter, and we want to make sure that those words are substantive and they speak to the concerns that folks have around social and racial justice in New Jersey. All right. Ryan Hager, the CEO of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Ryan, thank you very much. So, Mary Ellis, that's the situation here. About a two-hour debate starts at 6.30 all the way to 8.30 this evening. So it should be what a lot of people here are coming to see, the candidates talking about the social justice issues of our time. Mary Ellis, back to you. Thank you, Michael. We'll be watching. Standing by now with a look at today's business news is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda, another review of regulations for renters? That's right, Mary Alice. What we're seeing is that Tom's River is the latest community that's reviewing how it handles short-term rentals offered by websites that include Airbnb. Next week, a public hearing will be held on a revised ordinance that would actually reduce the minimum number of rental days on properties from three nights to two during most of the year. Now, that reduction covers properties on the Barrier Island. A minimum 30-day stay would be enforced in all other parts of Tom's River. Asbury Park is also drafting an ordinance to regulate short-term vacation stays, even as a bill advances through the state legislature that would impose taxes and fees on such rentals. This is College Decision Day for high school students across the country, and no doubt that means many families will be taking on debt to pay for college in the fall. A recent report by the New York Federal Reserve found that student loan balances increased last year and now stand at more than $1.3 trillion. Now compare that to the total amount of credit card debt in this country. It is less. That debt totals about $780 billion. More than 4 million student loan borrowers were in default as of the end of 2016, up from 3.6 million in 2015. Put another way, 3,000 Americans default on a student loan each day. Ahead of a meeting this week by the U.S. Federal Reserve on interest rate policy, there were a few weaker than expected economic reports released. Factory activity across the nation slowed in April, while consumer spending was unchanged in March. Economists do not expect any changes on rate policy from the Fed this week. One of the country's biggest poultry producers, Tyson Foods, is the latest company to announce plans to stop using antibiotics in its chicken products by the end of next year. Tyson joins competitors Purdue and Pilgrim's Pride in making that change. Numerous fast food companies have also gone antibiotic free. On Wall Street, stocks were mixed. The Dow did close lower, but the Nasdaq ended at a record high. And those are today's top business stories.
Support for the medical report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. One American dies every 19 minutes from an overdose of heroin or prescription opioids. That's according to Governor Christie's office. He was tapped by President Trump as chair of an opioid crisis and drug treatment task force. And today, the governor was among the headliners at the New Jersey Hospital Association's annual Mental Health and Substance Use Disorder Summit. Brian Venosi reports on New Jersey's drug addiction crisis. This is a medical issue, not a moral failing on the part of those suffering from these illnesses. After spending his early years trying to hide the mental health and addiction issues plaguing his family, Patrick Kennedy, son of the political dynasty, is spending the rest fighting it, anchored here in New Jersey. If this were cancer, we'd be screening them early. Well, do you have a family history of cancer? Do you have a family history of stroke? I mean, we ask all these questions in the rest of medicine but not in mental health, not in addiction. Kennedy spoke to a couple hundred members of New Jersey's healthcare community as part of the New Jersey Hospital Association's Summit on Mental Health and Substance Use Disorder. The former congressman and son of Ted Kennedy sponsored the leading legislation for parity, giving physical and mental health equal access to care and coverage. The irony is the first time I really talked to my father about these issues, was over the negotiating table as we were trying to reconcile my House bill, which included addiction and trauma, and his Senate bill, which only covered biologically based disorders. You can't make this up. He shared detailed memories growing up in a house where addiction dictated daily life and praised the work being done in New Jersey. At the helm, Governor Christie, working to turn the tide on opiate addiction. A recent Pew study showed four out of five heroin addicts started with opioids. We know that our emergency department visits in the state of New Jersey have increased overall by more than 117,000 patients from 2014 to 2015. And nearly half of those individuals, 46 percent, had a mental health or substance use disorder diagnosis. Last year's summit announced a behavioral health collaboration with five South Jersey health care providers. Governor Christie told today's group innovative partnerships will be the way forward. He's working to build more sober living homes and increase the amount of detox beds in the state. The first thing we need to do is to eliminate the shame. The second thing we need to do is we better start educating the medical profession about what's going on here. It is appalling to me that there is no requirement in medical school curriculum to teach physicians and other health care providers about the dangers of prescribing these drugs. As chairman of the federal task force to fight opiate addiction, Christie said he plans to visit Silicon Valley and use the thinkers at Google and Facebook to revamp prevention education. See, here's the problem. We believe, as a society, even though we don't say this out loud, our actions are saying it, that these people are getting what they deserve. We are saying to people, you made the choice to try drugs in the first place. What do you want us to do about it? The two political powerhouses vowed to keep this a nonpartisan issue, stressing its urgency. Kennedy called this a shared responsibility, echoing his late uncle RFK's famous Ripple of Hope speech. He said it's part of all our lives to help bring about this change. In Princeton, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. Tomorrow on NJTV News, lawmakers hear from the acting education commissioner about school funding. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow.
the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who keep the Garden State growing, business leaders, the caretakers of our historic landmarks, and the custodians of our public safety, the people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. Together, we're beating cancer. Together, we're unlocking the mysteries of the brain. Together, we're changing the way healthcare is provided, delivered, and imagined. Welcome to RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey's most comprehensive healthcare system with 41,000 medical professionals serving millions of people throughout New Jersey. So when it comes to your health and wellness, you're never alone. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together.